uh, whiskey readers, usually I start with some crazy cold open in the hopes to hook you to watching this video. Uh, but really today we're talking about something much more simple. My name is Jay West, better known as Take, and I work for Whiskey Readers, which means that I am a whiskey expert and I am paid to drink whiskey, which seems like the dream because it really is. But a lot of people ask me, hey Jay, how can I drink whiskey? Because uh, a lot of people are intimidated or they just don't know. And I always like to tell people that whiskey is not intimidating, but there are definitely right and wrong ways to drink it. Now, before you get your pitchforks over that last statement, let's grab some whiskey and we'll dive into what I'm talking about. I'm gonna walk you through how we taste whiskey today. Uh, I like to use a glass called the Glencairn. It is, uh, it looks pretentious, but really this is an $8 glass in pretty much any state you live in. You can buy it on Amazon. It's not fancy, it is super hardy. These are really tough to break. Some people uh, try to convince me that Glencairns are super, <laughs> super fragile, but the reality is that I've broken zero Glencairns in like the last three years. I manhandle these things, they go right in the dishwasher. Uh, they are tools, not pets, if you ask me. But the reason that I like a Glencairn glass is that it has this perfect kind of funnel shape. So we call it a tulip. Uh, you can kind of see it here. And the whole goal is that it's got a nice kind of bulbous bottom that holds the whiskey. And then it's got a nice like kind of fluted snout that is gonna pull together the aromas and make it easier for you to smell and taste. So today uh, we're talking about how I, a whiskey expert, a whiskey professional, uh, would recommend that you drink whiskey because it's not that hard and it can be a lot of fun, but there are definite technical uh, tips to make your experience easier. So how do you drink whiskey, you say? The easiest way is to just put it in your mouth. I'll be you will lose a little bit of character. Today also we're talking about a cool whiskey. This is Old Bones 15 year old rye. Uh, this is coming from the Backbone guys. This is technically, I want to say, would have been like a like a bone snapper, but it's 15 years old. I believe it's sourced from Canada. Uh, this guy, 60% ABV, so that's going to be perfect for what we're working on uh, just outside of Montreal. So this is a Canadian rye for sure. But as you see, you know, I like to pour, this is about an ounce. A lot of people uh, think that you need to pour way up here to get a full two ounce pour and they're shocked that like really two ounces is kind of right through the middle of the Glencairn here. So I like to put an ounce in, you can kind of swirl it around, this coats the glass. Uh, this means it's going to open up some of the aromas. Basically the more surface area the whiskey is on, air is going to be touching it. It's not oxidizing it. You don't have to worry about like drinking this in the first five minutes, otherwise it's going to evaporate. But what we do want to do is start to kind of coat the glass because it's going to help us get as much whiskey as possible up to what we call our olfactory. Now our olfactory is basically just like your nose, eyes and throat. Uh, they're the things that put together the way we smell and taste things. And a lot of people don't really realize that like the more you smell, the more you're going to taste. So if you have problems with your nasal cavity, if you are stuffed up, if you have a cold, if you have allergies, this is springtime in Wisconsin, the allergies are about to hit us like a 10 pound brick. So if your nasal cavity is all blocked up, if you're sick, that is going to contribute to being less good at tasting. Now you can still drink whiskey, it's not gonna hurt you while you're sick. It's not gonna help you get any better. Whiskey is certainly not medicine, despite what a lot of people like to think. Uh, and honestly, hot toddies have only ever made me worse myself. If you can't taste it as well, it's less enjoyable. Personally, it's not worth the calories to me if I can't taste it, and it's certainly not worth the, the work on my liver. At the end of the day, you know, it, it's gonna be just fine. So if we bring the, the Glencairn up to your nose, you're gonna start to get those the smell of the whiskey. I'd say like four to six inches. You can get really close if you want, but the higher the proof, it's gonna sting your nostrils. You're gonna pick up that ethanol. If you sniff from too far away, you know, you're gonna get kind of a glimpse of the whiskey, but you're not gonna get a great, a great character from it. So I like to say four to six inches. Fun fact is that your nostrils smell differently. So I like to go kind of back and forth. This is where people get into like, ooh, it's super pretentious, but uh, it doesn't have to be. We're just trying to pick up as much flavor as possible. So you can get really flowery, you can get really in depth, you can snort and sneeze and wheeze and make sorts of all crazy noises to make sure that everyone in the room knows that you're smelling whiskey. Uh, but a good smell, four to six inches away is perfect. On this pour here, I'm getting apples, I'm getting lots of red fruits. And so a lot of times when people talk about tasting notes, that seems pretentious as well. And it really doesn't have to be, right? I um, I encourage people to cook as much as possible because it's going to bring you as a person in to contact with more smells on a daily basis than anything else. Uh, you can go through the grocery store. I like to go through back before COVID, it was really easy. Like you could go to Whole Foods and they had all the bulk foods, right? Like the nuts, the fruits, the seeds, you could kind of give them a whiff. 
and all I'm doing when I taste whiskey is trying to correlate what's in here to things that I remember in my brain. Now that means I've been doing this longer, so I have a pretty good Rolodex of things and I'm very familiar with what things smell and taste like, but much like running a 5K, uh, you're not going to have all this experience on day one. So my biggest key is not to get discouraged when you can't pick out a note or when you smell something and you go, man, I just can't put my finger on it because it's totally fine. It means every, everything's working. You just need to spend more time with the whiskey and most importantly, spend more time with the things around you. But we're trying to correlate smells to memories because that's how we talk about things. And then you can put this whiskey into words that other people will understand. And so uh, this guy here, this 15 year old rye, 60% ABV, I'm going to give it a little diff distance from the nose. The ethanol is good there. Like I said, there's a lot of apple. There's a lot of red fruits. By red fruits, I mean, uh, there's like a nice like cherry. There's a blackberry. We're getting kind of that berry family of things. So things like a currant, uh, maybe boysenberry. This is a big, rich kind of tobacco-ness to it. Now, tobacco, uh, obviously some people think smoking a cigarette. For me, it's more like a pipe tobacco. It's rich, it's earthy, it's pungent, but in a way that's satisfying, that's enticing. Uh, there is little ethanol on the nose, which is great because it's 60% ABV. This thing should be coming out of the glass and smacking you, and it's not, so that's really good. One of the things we like to pay attention to is the alcohol integration. Does it drink hot for the proof that it is? Does it drink underproof? So if someone says, hey, it's 120 proof, but it drinks underproof, maybe it feels like it's 100 proof whiskey. So that's something we like to remark on as well. Now, when we get to the tasting, the tasting is the easiest part. You want a very small sip to start and you can work up to a little bit bigger sip. But the key is that a smaller sip is going to let it coat your palate nicely. It's going to be easy to taste it. And also it's going to begin generating saliva on your mouth, which is what's going to water down the whiskey and help it evolve on your palate. So when I, I give it a little swirl for us, just like to make sure we got all the air we want in there, give it a smell, start to register that in my brain, and then a little sip, nothing crazy. You will feel the whiskey hit the tip of your tongue. And I like to say, if this is the first pour of your day, your mouth, like mine is doing right now, because it's seven in the morning, is going to start generating tons of saliva. And that's because ethanol really shocks your palate. This isn't a bad thing, but what it means is it takes a couple tastes to really dig into whiskey. And it's one of the reasons that I also like to do tastings over multiple days. If you eat food, it's gonna change the way your palate works. If you're in a bad mood, if you're angry, if you're depressed, if you've just gotten off the phone yelling at someone, you're going to be in a different headspace that's going to impact the way you drink whiskey. Now, a lot of people say, you know, isn't it weird to drink whiskey at 7 a.m.? And the answer is absolutely yes, but this is my job. My palate is freshest in the morning. And as you can see, you take super tiny sips or I, if I'm doing a larger tasting, I have what we call a spittoon. So the goal is to taste, swish, and then spit out so you're not consuming as much ethanol. Now that's usually where my drinking stops until if we have wine or something with dinner. So this is definitely not an all day thing. I don't taste whiskey eight hours a day, every day. I make videos for you guys in the early morning when I have time. I do very quick early tastings. So like I'm trying to get kind of the essence. I'm trying to decide whether this is something that's going to be great, needs a lot of time to work through, or if it's just so-so or maybe something I'm not going to cover because I don't want to. If something is extra rank, I'll write a review about it. If something is super boring and totally uninteresting and I have a hundred other things to do that day, that's sometimes where my tasting will end. That's more of a technical detail, but it explains why I'm usually up in the morning. And like, if I'm super pumped about something like this old bones, uh, I want to be as fresh as I possibly can for my first take to see, you know, if this is, if this is going the distance, if this is something crazy, or if this is something that over the next couple days, I'll get to it when I get to it, finish up the review and the tasting notes, stuff like that. As it hits your palate, you're going to feel it kind of move across your tongue. You're gonna feel your palate generate lots of saliva. That actually is very handy because it works to kind of gradually proof down the whiskey in your mouth. And then you, as you take a sip and basically swallow, uh, that's what we'd call the finish. You're gonna feel it go down your throat. Now, a couple things to note there. Uh, as it's working across your palate, you're generally just trying to think about what does this remind me of? In this case, this had a lot of blackberry. This had a lot of like vanilla custard. There was a little bit of oak. Oak is an interesting note to talk about because a lot of people don't spend a lot of time licking oak. And that's totally fair. I don't spend a lot of time licking oak either, but oak makes our palate feel a different way. And that's what I wanna communicate when I write tasting notes to folks. So if you have a whiskey that's heavy on oak, you're gonna notice it feels dry. It's gonna feel almost tart. It's gonna feel uh, a little bit astringent on your palate. And what that means is when you swallow, your palate's gonna feel like all of that moisture generated and all that whiskey has just been whisked away. It means your mouth's gonna be dry. It's almost gonna feel a little bit chalky. And that is for, that happens when you have a whiskey that's heavily tannic. Much like a, a big rich California cab that's super tannic, that is also gonna 
to pull the moisture off of your palate. It's going to give you the feeling of being almost kind of cotton mouth, a little bit dry. And so when we talk about oak, we're also talking about integration a lot like the ethanol. Oak integration is nice because if you do it properly, it can add huge amounts of structure. It can add huge amounts of flavor. It can really give your whiskey like this backing kind of like skeleton and spine that carries and stretches the fruits and makes it really expressive and really long lived. And it can also kind of leave you with this huge finish that carries on forever because tannin, I don't want to say it sticks to your palate, but it feels like it sticks to your palate when it's done right. So when you see a whiskey talked about with like a huge eternal finish and you're getting all these flavors and it's just holding on a lot of the time, the tannin is very involved in that process as well. By there, we've kind of worked our way into what we call a tasting matrix. And those are the three things I like to talk about. I like to talk about the flavors. I like to talk about the ethanol and I like to talk about the oak. Now I'm more sensitive to oak, so I don't like as much oak as a lot of people do. I don't mind higher ethanol all, but I don't love things that are like 70% ABV because they feel tiring. <laughs> they make me tired. They're super ethanol forward. Typically they're very, you know, as the ethanol gets higher and higher and higher, the flavors constrict. They get to what we call a kind of singular in profile, which means there isn't a lot of diversity, but if there's maple and huge amounts of ethanol, it's going to just taste like a maple bomb. It's going to be very simple and very straightforward. And some people like that, but it's not always a sign of, of like a technically great whiskey. And that was a lot of talking, not a lot of sipping. I usually do a couple sips across the table. Tasting. I'm not going to here as much this morning, but the key is really when you're tasting to be not stressed out. Don't stress about this. If you are stressed out about tasting whiskey, then this is not right for you because this should be fun. This should be enjoyable. I got into this as a hobby that turned into a job and that is a huge blessing. But at the end of the day, it reminds me that like if this stresses you out, then like chillax. It's just whiskey. You want to smell. Let's start working on your Rolodex of smells. You know, if you can't pick a smell, write it down. It reminds me of these things, but I don't quite get it. Um, and as you're out kind of being mindful of that and thinking about it, that smell is going to hit you at some point, whether you're cooking a dish, whether you're walking around the park or the grocery store. Uh, I love to go to markets where lots of people are cooking different foods. Uh, it's really interesting because for a long time, I did not associate Port Char with Pete from Berkladi over in Scotland with barbecue ribs. And then I was walking through a festival in Cedarburg, Wisconsin, and someone was barbecuing ribs just right. And that like that smell totally hit me in the way that Port Charlotte Pete does. And so it's, it's very conversational, but also it's really interesting. And you can be as pretentious as you want. You know, if you're like apple pie on a hot sunny day, uh, you can say that it's not going to be relevant to as many people. Or you can say I'm getting apple, I'm getting cinnamon, I'm getting this nice caramel and a little bit of vanilla bean. Um, and it, it, it's kind of warm. So it's like pungent and I feel it up in my nose. And, and maybe that's part of the ethanol, but you've basically described the same things. You've used more words on one side, but you've also painted a more descriptive picture. And that's why I like to do my reviews. My reviews aren't super flowery. I would rather bang off all of the tasting notes and let you kind of put that together and be like, oh man, that reminds me of an apple pie. Although sometimes it is unmistakable. I'll say apple crumble is a favorite of mine or like a, like a peach cobbler pops up now. And that's just like, it's got oatmeal, it's got brown sugar, it's got cinnamon, it's got clove, it's got peaches, it's got a little vanilla and it's a very cohesive package. But all those things together make a very, very noticeable imprint on your brain and your brain can take you right to that. And so that's also how I remember tasting notes. Like if I try a bunch of whiskeys and I think about them really hard, I can remember, I can remember most of the tasting notes for most of the whiskeys in my home collection because they are, they're very imprinted. They're things that remind me of things. And that's why I tell people that with, tasting whiskey is not hard. You have to have a good palate, of course, like to be able to pick up the notes, but really it's all about making connections in your brain. And the more practice you give it, if you do it mindfully, if you do it for months, if you do it for days, you know, you, you should be drinking responsibly. But if you have a couple sips, if you're trying to be really thoughtful and, and take that ounce of whiskey and stretch it over 30 minutes as you're working through notes and stuff, um, you're going to be so much more mindful of how you consume whiskey. And you're also going to find that you're super mindful of how you consume everything else. Food is going to become a lot more fun. Beverages like tea or coffee. This is how a lot of people get into coffee or a lot of people come from coffee and get into whiskey because coffee is the non-alcoholic kind of component of like, let's get as nerdy as possible and deep dive into the flavors of this beverage as much as possible. And certainly this explains why sommeliers are so gifted and they're people I look up to so incredibly. And the wine industry is just crazy as well. There's so many more wines. It's crazy. There's vintage included. It's, it's very imposing. It's very difficult. It's something it's a skill I don't have, but would love to, to develop my wine palette. And it's something I work on basically when I'm not drinking whiskey. So that has been kind of a primer on how to taste whiskey. Hopefully I've broken down the basics. Let me know in the comments if there's something I missed, if there's something you want to know more about, if you have a question, a comment, uh, definitely not a concern. You can send that to someone else. But if you want to know 
more about tasting whiskey, I'm going to try and keep kind of these, I don't want to call them an industry insight, but like, you know, this is how I do my job. This is how you should taste whiskey. This is how you can be better at enjoying whiskey. I will do more of these videos. If you guys would like them, just let me know what you'd like to hear. So uh, this has been another great video here on the Whiskey Raiders YouTube channel, guys. I'm Jay, better known as Take. This is my job now, which is really cool, uh, but it also means that I have to go off and I have to taste some other whiskeys. So thanks for joining me this morning. I will catch you on the channel for another video, and I will see you for another release on Whiskey Raiders soon.